Hello again everybody, welcome to part 3 of this training video and this time we're going to be having a look at the hydraulic system the indications for which are shown on the bottom of the first officer's multifunction display screen. The Q400 has four hydraulic systems, three main and one auxiliary. The auxiliary system is actually hand driven uh, via a manually operated pump and is used to power the emergency landing gear extension in the event of a system malfunction. The landing gear extension system is actually underneath a panel on the flight deck floor. At the moment, as far as I know, it isn't currently modelled in the pilot version of the Q400, the Majestic Q400, but uh, I think it will be in the Pro version. Systems 1 and 2 are really the main hydraulic systems and are powered by engine driven pumps. The nominal pressure for these is 3000 psi. System 3, which is more of a backup system, is driven by a 28 volt DC electrical pump and provides redundancy coverage for the elevators if systems 1 and 2 aren't working correctly. System 1 also has a backup. It's an AC electrically driven standby hydraulic pump and the master switch for it is located here on the main panel. It will operate automatically if there's a failure on engine number one or if the flaps are selected to a setting greater than zero with the parking brake selected off. Nevertheless uh, it is standard operating procedure to depress the switch and to energize the standby hydraulic pump as a backup during takeoff and landing. The backup or standby pressure is shown here on the first officer's multifunction display. A PTU or power transfer unit acts as a backup to system 2 and transfers power from system 1 in the event of a system 2 failure. The master switch for the PTU is located here and will energize automatically if the parking brakes off flaps set to greater than zero degrees and the pressure in system one is more than 2400 psi however uh, like the standby hydraulic pressure system it is standard procedure to energize the PTU both for takeoff and landing as a backup. System number three is more of a backup system as I've said uh, and is isolated from the hydraulic system in normal operation but this isolation valve can be manually opened using the guarded push button. Once depressed this would mean that system 3 was now operating the or rather powering the elevators. It is actually standard procedure after engine start to test the number 3 system by depressing the guarded switch and ensuring that you have full elevator movement and also ensuring of course that the required pressure on system number three is displayed on the first officer's multifunction display and we're looking as with system one and two for 3000 psi or as near to it as possible. It mustn't be forgotten however prior to departure that system number three in normal operation should be switched off and depressurized so don't forget to switch the system off afterwards this can be done simply by deselecting the push button, putting the guard back on. And to depressurize the system, you may have to move the elevators forward and backwards a few times, and you'll notice the pressure uh, accumulated in system three will drop back to zero. The hydraulic quantities of each system reservoir are shown on the multifunction display system as well. You can see at the moment they're currently at 100%. They don't have to be at 100% for dispatch but the minimum quantity is actually 50%. Next we'll look at the flight controls. The primary flight controls, i.e. the elevators, ailerons and rudders, are hydraulically powered and are termed the powered flight control surfaces. The master switches for the spoiler and rudder power are located here on the glare shield. The controls are also fitted with a gust lock located here on the pedestal and when engaged the ailerons will be locked in place to prevent any unwanted control movement on the ground. 
The aircraft has spoilers which assist ailerons in roll control and they also act as lift dumpers on touchdown to reduce the wing's lift capability thereby ensuring the aircraft adheres better to the ground for uh, more effective braking and so on. The spoiler extension also reduces the overall landing roll distance and if the throttles are closed on takeoff the spoilers will also extend to increase drag and help the aircraft slow down for a rejected takeoff. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The aircraft doesn't have speed brakes that can be extended in flight as you may be used to in other airplanes like the uh, like the Airbus or the 737 but as you'll find as you fly the Q400 more this isn't actually necessary anyway. The bottom of the captain's MFD shows the position of the flight controls. Here we have an indication of the spoiler, elevator and rudder deflection. Trimming of the rudder and the aileron can be achieved using the switches on the pedestal here and the position of the respective trims can be shown here on the gauges. It is standard procedure given the aerodynamic effect of the propeller on application of takeoff thrust to offset any extraneous yaw by setting about a needle's width of right hand rudder trim prior to departure. That should do it. In normal operation the captain's control column controls the flight spoilers for roll and the first officer's control column controls the ailerons and in normal circumstances the two control columns are interconnected so both pilots have full authority over both the spoilers and ailerons simultaneously. If however there is a jam of either the spoilers or the ailerons the spoiler and aileron control systems can be separated using using the disc lever here on the pedestal. The pilot with the unjammed controls can then maintain control of the aircraft. The spoilers have three modes, flight, ground and taxi. In flight mode the spoilers operate in conjunction with the ailerons for roll control as we've already said. In ground mode the inboard and outboard spoilers extend to dump lift on landing and we've already discussed that as well. But for this lift dumping to occur the flight taxi switch must be in flight the power levers must be less than 12 degrees in the flight idle mode and both main gear weight on wheel sensors must have detected that the aircraft has landed with the spoilers extended the roll inboard and roll outboard advisory lights located here will illuminate and the flight taxi switch must be selected in flight mode prior to departure. It is important to make sure that during the takeoff roll the inboard and outboard lights here have extinguished and that the spoilers position of which shown here on the captain's multifunction display are retracted. If this isn't the case then the takeoff has to be rejected. The taxi mode is obviously used for taxiing out and in. Uh, if you forget to place the switch to flight prior to takeoff, a solenoid will actually ensure that the switch reverts automatically to flight mode if the power levers are opened up greater than 12 degrees past the flight idle position. The pitch trim indication is shown here to the left of the parking brake selector. The white block shows the acceptable elevator trim takeoff range. If the MAC percentage shown on the load sheet, or in our case the Majestic control panel, is 14% or less, the needle should be in the aft limit of the white block. And if the MAC is 36% or greater, it should be in the forward edge of the block, and any intermediate MAC positions, the needle should be set to the middle of the takeoff block. The flaps the lever for which is located here are electronically controlled and powered by the flap control unit 
with five flat positions, 0 degrees, 5 degrees, 10 and 15 and 35. And the flat position is shown on the flat gauge here on the left of the bottom segment of the first officer's multifunction display. Takeoff is usually achieved with five degrees of flap extended. Though if taking off a runway of less than 1800 meters takeoff distance it may be advisable to use 10 degrees. Landing is usually performed with 15 degrees of flap. Though if we're landing on a short runway 35 degrees can be used and 10 degrees would only generally be used for landing in the event of a single engine approach. The GPWS landing flap selector allows the pilot to select which flap setting he anticipates to use for landing and this should be set prior to departure. It's usually flap 15 so if we're landing on a short runway perhaps Southampton or Guernsey somewhere like that flap 35 will be considered and setting this correctly will ensure that the GPWS incorrect flap setting warning uh, won't be triggered during the approach. If, if during the approach the flaps are extended beyond 5 degrees without the landing gear extended the gear warning horn will sound. The aircraft has stall protection in the form of stick pushers and shakers and the stall protection should be tested prior to commencing the first flight of the day using the switch on the test panel located here. Because the Q400 is a T-tail aeroplane it is prone to what we call deep stalling and it's therefore mandatory to have a stick pusher as well as a stick shaker installed and I'm sure you already be familiar with the stick shaker if you've ever flown the uh, PMD, PMDG 737. The stick shaker warns the pilot to take stall recovery action and if this isn't taken then the stick pushers will push the control column forward uh, to break the stall. The landing gear is hydraulically powered. The gear lever is a simple up down and the lights show landing gear and gear bay door status. The top row of lights are for the gear bay doors. If amber the gear bay doors are open and if blank they're closed. The second row of lights are the gear safe lights. If they're illuminated in green then the landing gear is down and locked in preparation for landing and if blank the gear is not down and locked. And the final row of lights are the gear unsafe lights. And if these are red, the related gear unit is not locked up or down. And if blank, then the gear is locked up or down. The gear lock release, the red switch here, overrides the automatic gear lever lock if necessary. The switch next to the landing gear lever allows the pilot to test the gear horn and also to mute the horn if required. The alternate gear release door is located in the flight deck ceiling. Opening the door, the alternate release door is located in the flight deck ceiling. Opening the door and selecting inhibit disengages normal landing gear operation via the gear lever on the main panel. Pulling the yellow and black handle will then isolate the gear hydraulic supply and allow for alternate gear extension using the control in the floor of the flight deck.